Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nicole Cabral, and I'm here to present with my colleague, Matt Langinger, Ways to Combat Bias in Schools, a New Resource. Uh, before we get started, uh, it would be a really good time now to review some of the technical aspects of today's presentation. Uh, so please do check the audio settings on your computer as well as your speaker volume settings if you're having any trouble with your audio. And if you're still having sort of issues with your audio, please see the detailed audio troubleshooting file available in the resource list beneath the Q&A window. There are also some other icons located at the bottom of the webinar console that open some additional feature panels. You can read about um, myself and my colleague in the speaker bio panel and access the resource list to download a copy of today's slides. To submit a question for, our, for me and my colleague um, to answer during the Q&A session, please type them in the Q&A box located above the resource list window. And just full disclosure, we have um, over 800 people registered for today's webinar, so very likely we won't be able to get to every question. But if you do have questions that we're unable to answer, we'll have our email address at the end um, available to you, so you can just email us. Now finally, an on-demand archive of today's presentation will be available online in the next 24 hours. Both the archive and a free-to-download version of the PowerPoint slides will be accessible through edweek.org. All right, so we have about an hour for today's uh, webinar. Um, and um, so as I, I mentioned, my name is Nicole Cabral. I'm the Associate Director um, for public engagement at Public Agenda, and I'm here with my colleague, Matt Langinger, who is a VP of public engagement at Public Agenda. Yes, I'm Matt Leininger. I've worked at Public Agenda for about three years and, and worked in this field of, of public engagement uh, my whole career, both on the practice side that we'll be talking more about today, you know, how do you actually engage people in a, an important issue like this one, um, and also somewhat on the research and writing side. So a little bit about Public Agenda. We've been around for over 40 years. We're based in New York. And really, our mission is to strengthen democracy and expand opportunity in America by fostering thoughtful public opinion, meaningful public participation, and responsive public institutions. Um, as I mentioned, I work in the public engagement department with Matt. been here at Public Agenda for over four years now, um, working on a variety of issues from um, K-12 education, higher ed education, and and, and in my background, I, I have an um, experience in um, working internationally on these issues, um, as well as throughout the country. So very excited to bring this, this resource to you all. So what are we going to be talking about today? Um, over the past year or so, we've partnered with the Nellie Mae Educational Foundation to create a resource for schools as well as non-school-based programs to begin to address bias-related incidents on their campuses. Um, so we created a tool, a guide, that high school students can use to hold these conversations um, in their schools. And we also created uh, a text-enabled platform called Text Talk Engage that can either accompany the guide or be used independently to have these conversations. So in this webinar today, we'll be walking you through the guide as well as, as the Text Talk Engage tool and give you, we'll also be providing an example of a high school, Casco Bay High School in Portland, Maine, who's actually already used this guide and customized it to have um, some of these very difficult but important conversations on their campuses. So we'll be giving you some insights in how they've customized it and how it could look on your campus. Thanks, Cole. So, um, so this is a resource that we hope can be helpful to you all in a variety of different kinds of contexts. Um, it's not, certainly not the only resource one could use, but it's, one, it's something we think can be complementary that can be used in, in concert with other kinds of tools, uh, other kinds of trainings and workshops. And it could be something that you do kind of closer to the beginning of your efforts to address issues of base, bias and discrimination. Um, it, it, it kind of leads you to other kinds of um, steps, other kinds of resources, other kinds of tools. So we'll try to explain kind of how that might happen today. 
one of the things that we should say is that this also comes out of um, a, kind of a long history of work on issues of, of, of race and difference in many different kinds of contexts. Some of this work was done uh, starting in the, in the mid-1990s. I, at the time, I was working with an organization called Everyday Democracy, and they have a number of wonderful resources on their website as well that you might want to check out. Um, this one includes, it's in the same kind of spirit of some of those resources, it's a guide for discussion and action on the issue that kind of gives you a framework uh, for engagement on this issue. If you don't have the guide already, uh, I think when you registered, there was a link there to get it. Um, if you didn't see that or didn't click on it, all you need to do now is you could go to publicagenda.org, um, and, and the first thing you will see actually on our on our page, our organizational page, is is a, a link to this um, to this the, this guide. So you just click it and, and download it that way. So. In terms of this issue of, of, of kind of bias and discrimination, I mean, the, the, the kind of the reason this kind of resource came about is that we were in conversations with our, our colleagues at the Nellie May Education Foundation about this issue, and they were quite alarmed, as many people have been, about the rise of uh, racist acts and discriminatory behavior in schools, uh, which have increased in the last couple of years by 45%. So you, you see on your screen, there's a couple of stats here. Uh, it's actually 45% increase um, in, since 2016 in this, these kinds of um, incidents happening on school campuses. And the most common um, you know, way in which these happen, they, they tend to be targeting people, first of all, on the basis of race and ethnicity. So over 50% of these incidents have to do with race and ethnicity. Uh, the second most common um, you know, one on this list here is, is actually religion, and then sexual orientation followed by national origin or gender identity. So all kinds of people, uh, but in particular people of color, have been targeted um, in various ways or have been the victims of discrimination and bias on, on campuses. So the guide, we, we hope, will be helpful in a, in a number of different kinds of contexts, and we've designed it so that it can be portable and usable in those different kinds of settings. So it, it's laid out in, in kind of four different, four, four 60 minute sessions, they're sequential, and we'll go through each one in turn. And they could be used uh, with students or with students, groups that have students and, and adults in them. Uh, it could be group, groups of teachers alone, could be staff or parents. Uh, the, the, we tried to kind of make this guide something that can be kind of versatile and, and adaptable to these different kinds of contexts. But the idea is that the groups that will be using this is, you know, the, the groups are only about seven to ten people. You know, small groups are really critical to have kind of these kinds of tough, um, you know, con conversations about kind of difficult issues for people to feel safe, to people to be able to kind of compare their experiences, you really don't want groups any larger than, than 10. Now, in some of the impacts of this kind of work do depend on your ability to have large numbers of people in the process. And this might, might not be at the very beginning, but if, if you are hoping to have a really kind of great impact on kind of the, the, the entire uh, school community or, or the city or the town where you live, I mean, the, the more people you have participating, often the better in the sense that the, the more people uh, that are involved, the more awareness there, that is, there is, the more impact you may have on various kinds of policy decisions being made by different decision makers, uh, the more that you will have have people acting in various ways from their own personal behavior to working groups um, to advocating on, on, on behalf of other ideas, you know, the, the more people you have, the more power these kinds of processes tend to have. But in the, in the beginning, when you're first getting started, usually the, the best and easiest way to get going is just simply to have one group and have people go through these sessions and then decide the various ways you might want to use this, this resource in the future. So as I said, there's different kinds of settings. You could ha use this guide as part of a, a high school class discussion about issues of bias and discrimination. It could be used in an after-school program with students uh, at, that, in, at that time of day. Uh, Parent-teacher uh, conferences and meetings, school-wide events, uh, like the one we're going to describe later that happened in, in uh, that was organized in Casco Bay, and then also meetings of faculty and staff. So the this, this, this sessions kind of follow this sequence, which tends to be a kind of a, a proven, tried and true kind of sequence of discussion uh, that you see in all kinds of good public engagement processes. And the, the first thing is getting people to kind of talk about their experiences, why do they care about this issue, what's happened to them that really underlies what they think. That's often the most fundamental part of the conversation. 
the second session gets people talking about why they think these incidents might be happening now. The third has to do more with what people might do to prevent and address these issues. And both sessions two and three, we lay out some different options for people to talk about and consider, not to say that those are the only options that, that could you know, be, be considered, but, but that just to get the conversation going and to invite people to kind of come up with some of their own thinking. And then the fourth session is more about action and next steps. You know, what, what do people want to do on the basis of their conversation? What do they want to do with some of the ideas that they may have cooked up um, and how they kind of move further to kind of help address these issues in their, in their school or in their community? There's a few more sections at the end of the guide. One that has uh, is kind of a, a glossary of a bunch of different terms, definitions, um, person-centered language um, that people can use, and that's a, a kind of a way of talking about issues of bias uh, um, and issues of identity in ways that is empowering to people rather than kind of kind of um, categorizing people by their groups. That's essentially the idea of person-centered language, and I think you, you can see on that list a lot of different examples of what I'm talking about. There's a section that, that describes how the Casco Bay High School at Maine, uh, how they organize this process there with lots of interesting tips that you might use. And then there's some FAQs for people who are trying to uh, facilitate and, and uh, organize these conversations and some optional exercises and sources. But this first session is uh, you know, the, the, the most fundamental in the sense that this is where you're really getting people to understand one another. And, and this, is, this is based on a lot of research uh, from different disciplines, actually, about how people actually learn and how they uh, learn to understand views that they don't necessarily um, agree with. You know, first of all, that it's in, in face-to-face conversations uh, where people kind of have an, a, a sense of each other as people, first of all, um, that they really begin to kind of sometimes change their mind about things, or at least see things from a perspective they didn't see before. So when you, when you start out at this level and you, and you get people to talk about their experiences, um, it, it's something that's an easy way for all kinds of people to begin the conversation, and it's something that's very revealing and begins to build some bonds uh, among people in the group so that they can kind of um, begin to kind of try to, to – they have some empathy for one another, and they have some reasons to kind of tr want to try to understand why people have different views. Um, so in terms of the actual kind of pieces of the session, a, a first step is getting the group to kind of set some ground rules for how they're going to, to act and behave during the course of the conversations. That's also quite important, especially for, for a, a topic like this that's often very personal and, and emotional for people. So if you kind of start out by having them kind of propose some ground rules from themselves or look at and select some ones from a list that you give them, um, and, but, but that basically what you're doing is kind of getting them to kind of own the, the process and, and own those rules, and that will make them much more likely to actually use the rules as they go through the sessions. Then after that first part, you've got, like I was saying, a number of discussion questions which get people to talk about their experiences and why they care. And then there's a, a third section, part C, which is getting them ready for the next, the next one. The second session gets people to kind of try to um, – you know, look at some different possibilities for why incidents of bias and discrimination or hate crimes are happening more now. And it, it introduces a bunch of different potential views. Um, and, and part of the idea there is that you're putting views on the table that people may not have considered before, or there may be ones that they actually hold personally, but they're a little embarrassed or to kind of say them out loud in the group. So you can, as a facilitator, you, you can kind of ensure that a bunch of different ideas and, and opinions are getting out on the table um, by kind of having people look at this set of set of views and options and, and, and talk about, you know, which ones kind of resonate with them or what combinations of them resonate with them. With any kind of set of views like this, you always want to kind of state that, you know, look, these aren't the only possible things that are on the table uh, or that, that, are, that, that these aren't the only possible views. And in fact, you know, do you see, is there one that you can think of that we don't have here on the, on the page that you'd like to talk about? So then, so that's the bulk of this this session too. And and I should have said earlier that each of these sessions is designed to last you know, 45 to 60 minutes. And so there's something that can be done in a typical high school uh, class period or in a meeting, a one hour meeting of a PTA or a faculty meeting, things like that. The third session gets people to think about some possible ways they might prevent or address these issues. Um, so that, again, there's a, a number of different options uh, presented for discussion, not to say that, that they're the exhaustive list, but, but the different possibilities that people might want to look at and talk about the pros and cons of each one. 
Um, so you're kind of, again, giving them an opportunity to kind of talk about, to, to, to look at views they may not, or, or options that they may not have considered before or might not have um, considered carefully and, and decide what, what makes sense for them. The last session of the four is designed to get people talk to, to kind of get organized about actions and next steps I, I want to take. So it's likely that in the in the first three conversations there will have been ideas that people put forward that people came up with, and you can return to some of those and then do some brainstorming of other ideas that people might want to work on, you know, in their on their campus in their community. Um, and then the, the, the session also gives some 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 uh, suggestions about how to actually prioritize some of those ideas and and think through some of the, the kind of the practical next steps people might want to take for implementing them. These kinds of discussion uh, sessions really need some type of facilitation. So part of the organizing work, and again, there's more about this in the guide itself, but, but some of the organizing work you need to be thinking through at the beginning of this kind of, of, um, of exercise is, is to kind of think about who might uh, be good facilitators for this um, and how you might give them some preparation for leading some of these conversations. There can be all kinds of facilitators, and we'll talk in a minute about what, how they worked, did this in Casco Bay. In fact, the students, the students themselves were, were uh, most of, if not all, the facilitators uh, for the, the sessions that, that took place in Casco Bay. Um, so st students certainly can be in this role, but also teachers, um, parents, uh, other staff, other community members. Um, essentially, you know, you can have different kinds of people serve in this role, but, but the, the, the key thing is that people uh, need to kind of understand the role you're asking them to play. And the first bullet on this list that we're, we're looking at right now is, is the most important thing, when, that when you're asking people to, to be prepared to facilitate something, you're asking them to be impartial. You're trying to, to help them understand that their role is not to kind of lead the group or educate the group. Their their role is to kind of serve the process, uh, to ensure that you know no one person dominates the conversation, to make sure that the quieter people have a chance to jump in, uh, to make to help the group kind of use the guide, the discussion materials that, that you're that you're giving them, uh, to use the, the the time that the, that they have um, to kind of set these ground ground rules for how they're going to act. Um, so, and then, then kind of slightly more advanced facilitation skills, what you'll be asking them to do is to kind of help clarify key points in the conversation, to summarize some of the key points, um, and to, to kind of generally to, to put the group first. I think at that point, moving on to Casco Bay. Okay, wonderful. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, Casco Bay High School, based in Portland, Maine, um, piloted this guide in their school. And um, it, it was interesting timing because there was actually an incident of uh, racial bias um, that occurred affecting um, one of the students in the high school. It occurred off campus, but um, it it's, was very an incident that was very fresh in the minds of the student and the faculty. And in fact, uh, this picture that we're showing is of students protesting um, in the wake of that incident. Um, so this was really timely for them to utilize the guide in galvanizing the students to really think about how to have uh, conversations about this on their campus, as well as start thinking about some action planning on how they could prevent it or address it in the future. So um, we provide more details in exactly how they use the guide in the guide, um, but here's some quick hits on what they did. So essentially, they customized the guide for their for their purposes. Um, and um, in the guide, in the sections, um, FAQs for um, facilitators and faculty supporters, um, as well as the optional exercises to prepare with the guide, um, it shows um, kind of step by step how they how they decided to customize the guide. So that's the beauty of this resource. You could use it um, exactly how it's written verbatim, or you can you can create um, use it to create something that fits your needs. Um, the other thing that they did is they had some ongoing. Um, programs, social justice programs, exploratory programs, and they incorporated this tool, this resource in their ongoing program. So it wasn't something that they had to sort of start from scratch. Um, it, it worked well with some of the work that they've already been doing around these issues. 
they decided to open the discussion to the wider community. So it was open to adults. And in fact, uh, they advertised it in various ways and provided free lunch and even babysitting to make sure that it was an inclusive process for all involved. They also decided to use students as facilitators. They chose their 10th graders to do that and provided them with some training, some quick tips on how to, how to facilitate conversations, um, utilizing some of the tips that we included in the guide and then also some very specific tips that were that were um, sorry that were um, appropriate for for a sophomore class. As I said, they customized it, and in doing so, they reworked it. So they did it in three sessions, um, as opposed to four. And they also did the guide in one day event. So the guide can be done in separate, um, could be four sessions done in four different times. But they decided to condense it to three sessions, and did those three sessions over the course of a school day. Um, and as I mentioned, they added supplementary sessions. And for them, they told us when we debriefed with them that it was really um, sort of the highlight of the year, this, this opportunity for students to take leadership positions and involve the wider community on, on issues that are, are sensitive and oftentimes difficult to talk through. Um, and they are planning on making it into an annual event. Okay. Um, and I also uh, mentioned that sort of um, complementing the guide, we created an exercise where you can utilize um, text-enabled platform to have small group conversations on the same issue of, of addressing bias-related incidents. Um, and essentially, um, the exercise is now open. We're launching it today. And all you have to do is gather a few people, could be adults, could be younger people, it could be a mix of the two. And you will text the word ENGAGE to the number 89800, and you receive a number of prompts, starting with some sort of ground rules to help, um, help sort of organize the conversation, and there'll be polling questions similar to some of the polling questions that we started today's webinar with, sort of to get the conversation started, and then an assortment of discussion questions, and even videos so that it's sort of a multimedia, multi-sensory experience. And essentially, you in your small group are facilitated through the text prompts to have this conversation around bias-related incidents. And it can be done anytime, anywhere. So it could be done, again, in a school-based setting, non-school-based setting, at home, in faith-based settings. So anywhere you have a group of people and you want to have this conversation, it's sort of facilitated in real time. And it, it can take about an hour, uh, really less than an hour, really depending on how much, um, how, how the conversation transpires. And um, what's really interesting is although you're having this face-to-face -face conversation, you're sort of linked in to people around the country. It really could be around the world having these conversations if they're using the same platform. So you can actually, with your polling questions and the responses that you submit to the discussion questions, you can actually see some of the results that other folks around the country are, um, are responding in real time. And um, sort of to kind of tap into social media, um, a really interesting thing about this is afterwards you can sort of uh, take a picture of the group and um, post it online so that that we can kind of see the larger movement of folks around young people and adults around the country having these conversations. Okay. Oh, I know we, we gave you a lot of information. Um, I think there's some questions already, but if you have additional questions, you can just simply go to the Q&A sort of prompt at the bottom of your screen and type in your, your question. So just looking at a couple of the questions that people already um, uh, um, already put forward, we've been trying to kind of answer these as they've come in. So you may have heard us typing furiously in the background. But but you know, one one person asked about kind of um, how how would you deal with sustained low level racism, i.e. racial epithets as nicknames that have been tolerated for a long time by the student on the receiving end. And so basically, part of what you're hoping. Um, 
to do through, through using this kind of research, this guide is to create a, a safe space where people can talk about those kinds of things and raise them. And it may be that they're raising them as, as, as the victim, as the target of this kind of uh, behavior, or maybe it's they're raising it because they've observed it happening to someone else. But either way, you're creating a situation where people are, are, are you know, it's explicit that people are being asked, you know, how have you uh, uh, dealt with these kinds of issues? What, what have you experienced? And then, you know, in, in the course of the conversations, you're giving people an opportunity to kind of gain support from others, to, to kind of um, find allies and other people who will help them figure out, you know, how to deal with that particular um, situation or what or something else that they may have that may have um, encountered. Uh, another, um, and please do go ahead and keep keep questions coming. We will get to as many of these as we as we can. Um, Will this, so another person, and this was a, a question um, asked actually even before the webinar started. I know some of you um, use the registry, uh, the register um, page to kind of ask questions that you hope we would address. I think we've, we've I'm hoping that we've, we've actually addressed a whole bunch of these in the course of the presentation so far, but let me look through and, and see if there's others that we may not have, have dealt with. Uh, one person asked, will this address civil discourse, both verbal and written, or email? And, and yes, um, one thing that, that the guide you know, does ask about that we're hoping people will bring up in these kinds of sessions is you know, not just kind of face-to-face uh, -face or verbal incidents of harassment or discrimination, but also situations where this has happened through social media, uh, email, things like that. So, so, so we're, we're kind of asking, the guide is ask, asking specifically about a range of different um, kind of ways in which um, this behavior can kind of um, take place. Uh, another person has asked, um, you know, to what degree are these strategies research-based? What um, and and. So in that um, vein, let me say a couple different things. One is that, as I was saying earlier, that, that, that a lot of the kind of the, um, uh, psych psychology research about how people change opinions and how people kind of um, learn together, that, that that kind of research is reflected in this sort of approach in this sense that it's you know small group, face to face, um, asking questions about people's experience first, you know, and, and a lot of the evaluation of, about how engagement works and the benefits of these kinds of processes has to do with the, those kinds of experiences and those kinds of uh, the fact that people will in fact learn from one another um, you know in these kinds of settings when they won't simply by reading something or react to something on television or things like that um, the other thing this is based on is a whole lot of kind of in the world kind of practice um, that that you know starting 20 years ago that there have been lots of um, you know work engagement kinds of um, processes um, and, and workshops and things like that uh, which use which address issues of, of of um, uh, bias and um, racism and other kinds of discrimination in different kinds of contexts, in the context of policing and public safety, or in schools, uh, or in the community, um, and that that a lot of the learning that you see here in the guide uh, comes from the, kind of the shared uh, knowledge gained through a lot of those kinds of processes, and in particular for this one, of course, the example of, of, of Casco Bay and what they what they did there. Oh, here we go. Yes, lots of questions. <laughs> You're keeping us on our toes. Um, how can you get the guide? Oh, so here's the basic question. Um, so the guide, if, if you missed at the beginning of the, of the, of the webinar, um, you can go to publicagenda.org, and the, probably the first thing that you're going to see on the page there um, is this big purple cover that you've seen already. Um, and in fact, actually, let's switch the screen here because also... Uh, here we go. Here's a link that you can see right there. Um, so uh, you can re simply reproduce that that hourly link that you see on the page. That will get you directly, I think, to the download. Or go to publicagenda.org, uh, and you'll you'll see um, the guide and other resources as well. Um, there's some other questions about have other districts, were they able to utilize the guide and are they able to share their, their stories? So at this point, no, only Casco Bay um, has been able to pilot it. Um, so um, we're hoping, you know, we're launching it today, so we're hoping uh, that other districts will be able to utilize it and, and we would love to capture those stories as well. Um, there's a, a question about the results of the Casco Bay um, experience and did the students come up with actions to move forward? Um, they did, um, and I think um, the next step is really um, 
working with the students to create, um, I guess the way I would phrase it is, is almost realistic. Um, I think they had, my recollection is that they had um, ideas that in many ways they didn't have the power to change, so it, it structures within with, within the, the system that um, enabled um, bias-related rela incidents to occur. So really looking at what's possible um, for a student to really tackle, but I think it's, for me, it was also really elucidating to hear that students are thinking big picture structural issues that are the core to some of the issues around bias-related um, incidents and bullying. Any others that you see here, Matt? Sure. sure, yeah. So another person asked, how can this model be used to approach institutional or systemic bias within a school or district? So I think one thing that's important to say is that, you know, uh, institutional uh, bias, systemic biases are, of course, you know, long-term entrenched questions. They, these are not things that are going to be um, kind of shifted through kind of a four-session discussion process. However, um, there, this w w part of what we're, our hope is, and, and what we've seen in other kinds of engagement processes, by starting with this way, by getting people and a variety of people to the table to talk about, you know, how these issues are affecting them, and to talk about what they might do about them, that they can, in fact, you know, begin to to kind of work on these kind of longer-term entrenched kinds of challenges. Um, so there is, in fact, among the views that you see in the guide, there are views which are about institutional racism and other kinds of, of bias. Um, and some, some of the pro options um, suggest kind of ways to kind of to, to try to tackle those. So, so some of that is, you know, is already introduced into the conversation through the discussion materials in the guide itself. Um, just to give you a sense, I mean, in, in other kinds of settings, and, and this is, as Nicole was just saying, this is a brand new guide. So this has been used essentially in Casco Bay, um, and that's, that's the kind of one place. But, but there are other kinds of processes with similar sorts of um, materials, um, and similar kind of sequence of sessions, similar kind of organizing approach, and those have had a number of, of outcomes which have, in my mind, uh, are, are institutional. I mean, so one, one example I can think of is uh, a school district which um, – use this kind of process um, for a variety of reasons, end up constructing a new school actually in the district with a whole different kind of curriculum um, and a whole different kind of level of parent involvement um, to kind of partly because of the institutional biases and um, institutional um, racism that they saw in their district. Um, that was one example. Another a situation, and actually this has happened in several communities, where people um, ended up changing the, the formulas for hiring uh, for staff uh, of our uh, police departments and school systems based on kind of discussions that they had about how to address issues of race and difference in their communities. Uh, several people have asked about kind of related sorts of guides on other kinds of issues or related issues, and there certainly are plenty of things out there. Um, and certainly the Public Agenda website, you know, there are other kind of materials that we have that you may find uh, on other issues. And as I said also at the beginning of the, the webinar, um, Everyday Democracy, which is uh, the website there is Everyday uh, hyphen democracy.org. They also have lots of discussion materials. Uh, another source is um, the Kettering Foundation, uh, the National Issues Forums guides. They have done uh, guides with a similar sort of uh, process on many, many other kinds of uh, public issues. So those are three uh, that you can look for, and and, um, and also on all three websites, I think you'll find link, other links to other organizations, other other resources that might be might be helpful. Um, we will be sending out a follow-up email to this this. Uh, webinar, which will include, uh, you know, the, the guide itself, just one more time, the, the link, and, and um, it will try to actually deal with some of the questions that we're not able to kind of address in the time we have here. Um, so there was a, there's some more questions about Casco Bay, which I can handle. Um, one of them was, did students require emotional support staff to be on hand during the discussions? Um, they did not have a need for that. But the school did um, provide social workers um, sort of on call during the day in case they were needed. Um, so that's something that they did recommend um, when you're doing these type of um, exercises to um, to really think through. Um, another question was, how is disruptive behavior dealt with during the sessions, or what is in place for that? Um, so um, I guess uh, Casco Bay, when we spoke with them, 
they did not have um, an issue with that. Um, but I think um, I think having to the to the extent possible, really doing some training with the facilitators, especially around handling conflict, I think is really important. Um, Casco Bay had used student facilitators, but they did have pair them with um, teachers, adult teachers, um, to help them with facilitating the process. So I think that having sort of that buddy system is really important. Um, and there was, there was another question um, about uh, how can you effectively deal with privilege without alienating or turning off the students you're talking with and about their behaviors? And I think that's a really important question. It's something that we dealt with um, as we thought through the construction of the guide. Um, we wanted to make it, to the extent possible, as nonpartisan, uh, maybe that's not the best term, um, but as nonpartisan as possible so that it's accessible for, for different types of different people with um, and students with different um, sensitivities. So in this guide, we decided not to tackle privilege. It was something that we talked about um, at length, but um, because we know that that could be non-starters for, for some people in entering these conversations. But I think it, it, as you think about your population and how to address this effectively for the group of um, of um, people that you're working with, it's definitely something to keep in mind and how, and if you want to include that and how you want to do it. I think where it can come up in the context of this current guide is really that those sort of initial conversations um, um, where folks talk about kind of where they're coming from, which it can, privilege can definitely be incorporated into that a little bit more explicitly. Um, there, there was also just one more comment um, further down um, about using it in a classroom of 25 to 30 people, and it seemed like the, the question was around, is that possible since this is mainly small groups? Um, what we would recommend is not having a, a, a large group conversation on this issue with 30, 20 to 30 people, so you can even break that classroom into small groups of you know, 7 to 10, break it in half or, or by third to have a more effective um, conversation. So one of the questions that, that uh, I wanted to also address is um, one person who asks, I, I have a number of students from conservative religious families who feel their opinions are being ignored. How can I provide a forum that allows all students to be heard and respected, thus allowing all to learn? And there was actually a, cu there was a number of questions um, both before the webinar and during the webinar that are on that same kind of line. Another person asked, um, how do we get people to actively and productively engage in conversations concerning bias when they immediately become defensive? So this is um, partly why uh, kind of the, the, the framing, as Nicole was describing, is the way it is. I mean, you, we're trying to kind of welcome a lot of different viewpoints in a way that's a, you know, kind of a safe space, a non-judgmental space for people to kind of talk about why they care about this issue. Uh, and, and the views themselves, both, both the kind of the, the, the different explanations that you see in session two about why, you know, why are these incidents on the rise, and then the, the set of options in the, in the third session about what should we do about it, they include a range of things. You know, more, more you know, they're intentionally, they include you know, kind of more politically conservative or socially conservative kinds of ideas, as well as uh, more on the progressive side and, and kind of everything in between. So, so the idea here is to partly to kind of validate some different possibilities not, and, and to kind of not to say, of course, that any one of those views is right, but at least that, that these are all important opinions that many people bring to the conversation and that they all deserve to be considered. And that part of what we hope will happen and that should happen in these sessions is that people kind of, you know, really look um, kind of in, in, a, in a careful uh, in, in a sensitive way about these different ideas and kind of think about w w what reflects their experiences and what is going on in their campus, on their campus, in their community, um, and what they want to, what they want to do. So, um, Kind of a related question is um, something that somebody asked just now about um, implicit bias. Um, and the person says, uh, effective implicit bias training of school personnel has the potential to make a difference. Is this embodied in the guide? And so this is, you know, um, and yes, absolutely, implicit bias training can be extremely helpful um, and has the potential to make a difference. It is embodied in the guide in the sense that it, it is 
uh, one of the kind of the options that people could it's, it's listed there as something that people could to, to, could actually pursue to make a difference and it kind of describes a little bit what uh, implicit bias means and what these sorts of trainings are about so so it's presented there but in a way that you know it allows people to pick that among the uh, different options and talk about what it actually is and what it means for them uh, it's not something where we're kind of this is not from the beginning an implicit bias training or approach but it is something that could lead schools to get there if, if that's where people want to go. Um, a couple people have asked about kind of the protocol for using the guide, either with educators um, uh, or with students, and, and whether they need to inform us or anything like that. And, and basically, the answer is you're welcome to use this um, and also to adapt it, like the people in Casco Bay did, um, you know, to kind of fit your specific situation, your needs, the, the kind of information that, that people in your community need to know. Uh, we encourage all of that. Uh, you don't need to ask our permission to do it. We we certainly would like to hear how it goes, though, and so and we would like to kind of, um, you know, collect uh, as many of those kinds of stories as we can, because that is helpful to other people in other places who may be, uh, you know, dealing with similar situations um, to the, or have, living in different, in similar kinds of communities to the one you're in, or different similar kinds of uh, schools. So anyway, so the more of those kinds of stories or how people do engagement and how they kind of adapt it to fit their circumstances, that, that the more of those we can collect, the better. Uh, it, one one uh, a person asks here in the pilot did students require emotional support staff? Oh, you answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> here I'm reading other questions while you're answering them. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, right. Yes, it says what they've been answered. Okay. Um, uh, is recommending partnerships between schools and law enforcement. Okay. okay. I could address that one. So there was a question um, about um, about the one of the approaches um, about partnering with law enforcement. You know, uh, sorry, I don't have the question in front of me, but that could be problematic as an approach. I, I'm paraphrasing because of um, potential difficult relationships between certain students and law enforcement and the implications of that. So we 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 certainly recognize that, but we wanted to put sort of everything on the table in terms of options for people to brainstorm and, and have the students, adults, the community grapple with the trade-offs of each of these options and offer additional options. So though we certainly recognize that that's problematic, we want folks that are working through these issues that are using the guide to grapple with that as well. So, um, so that's the reason why some of the approaches, you know, may not be are not the silver bullet, and I think that that's the point of this, to have people really look at the trade-offs of different options. There's some, also some questions about um, how it could be used in, with faculty, with administrators that are um, that are dealing with bias and, and, and equity trainings are not working. Um, I, again, I think this is a great great tool that could be customized. It's written um, in many ways for um, for um, for high school students, but it can be easily adaptable for adults. It can be adapted to the workplace as well. I think just um, go ahead and use your creativity and, and, and create something that works for you, but there's certainly ways that this could be used, you know, perhaps even getting some external facilitators to help you work through these conversations in your workplace, um, and we'd love to hear about that as well. Here's a good one. Uh, the people we most need to reach regarding discrimination, uh, parents, teachers, students alike, are frequently the most resistant to educating themselves on bias, discrimination, discrimination et cetera. Um, are there any ways we can reach these reluctant people in order to facilitate a cultural shift toward acceptance, even in just a small way? So I, I think that the, the couple different ways of, of kind of answering this. First of all, kind of having um, you know an atmosphere uh, for addressing these kinds of issues that seems a very uh, uh, open, uh, not judgmental, um, and um, kind of say a safe space in the sense that it's a small facilitated group that 
that can often be be helpful. But and, and some people will be, become less reluctant because it seems uh, a, a more approachable to them than other kinds of possibilities. Many other people will not, however. I mean, <laughs> unless you know, it certainly if, if you do this in a classroom setting, you know, the students will be doing it all together. But but if you're talking about parents or teachers or other staff or the community members, you know, that that they're not captive audiences, and so some of them will not, you know, volunteer for this kind of work. So part of what happens, I think, though, in, in these kinds of processes is that you are kind of mobilizing everyone else. <laughs> you are kind of creating a situation where people be, will become allies, particularly for allies who for the people who have been most uh, targeted and most vulnerable to bias and discrimination. And so people will be more likely to speak up when they observe it happening, uh, more likely to kind of, uh, you know, surface, uh, you know, um, some of the uses of language and maybe even subtle kinds of things. People don't necessarily even realize that the kind of the language that they're using is, is biased or discriminatory. Uh, but when you have a situation where people have kind of talked to each other about kind of why this is important and they've heard people's stories about how it affects them, they're going to be more likely to kind of say, hey, wait a minute, you know, I don't know if you meant this this way, but, you know, uh, the, the way I heard what you just said is, you know, is, is something that could have hurt people. Um, and so, you know, the, you're kind of giving them some language and giving them some kind of um, moral support, basically, to kind of intervene or, or, or speak up in situations uh, where they see bias or discrimination occurring. Uh, so that even though, um, you know, as the person who asked this question is, is asking, I mean, even though the people who most need to be reached may not actually be at the table, this is something that can actually affect their behavior even um, by kind of Helping other people become more more educated and more kind of uh, supportive of one another, so they can they can deal with biased and discriminatory behavior. There's a, a question about can this guide be used for younger ages? Uh, certainly, I would recommend um, adapting the language for that age group so it's most appropriate. But certainly, um, I could I could see this being used um, easily for middle school and as it's adapted for, for younger, for elementary school as well as, as appropriate. Sorry. Someone asks, um, how do we address some of the most subtle forms of racism and bias, which is a lack of appreciation for the sensitivity that racial, ethnic, or religious groups have toward allegedly, in quote, lighthearted uh, pokes at their race, ethnicity, or religion? So, so um, I, get, I think what the person is, is talking about is situations where people, um, you know, don't mean to be uh, biased, or at least they claim not to be. You know, they, they, it's all in joke, it's all in fun, um, and yet this this language that they're using is in fact quite hurtful. Um, and so I think this is the kind of situation that, that we do hope that people, I mean, some of the questions um, and views kind of get at this and get people to kind of voice these kinds of situations that they have observed or part, been part of or been targeted in so that they actually can kind of, it's, it's a, a space where they can say, yeah, actually, you know, I, maybe this person was trying to, to kind of be funny, but in fact, this is something that hurts me, uh, hurts other people like me. And are there others who have kind of observed this can kind of say similar sorts of things. There's a, a question around, um, can this guide be used to discuss gender identity? Um, absolutely. Uh, we chose, um, it, it focuses quite a bit on race and ethnicity just because that is the biggest rise in bias-related incidents in schools around those issues. But um, if you notice in the, in the key terms, we do um, have person-centered terms, especially around gender, um, identity, et cetera. Um, I would, uh, and of course, um, you know, I, I reiterate uh, adapting this guide to, to work best for you, but I, I bring your attention to page 25, the optional exercises to pair with the guide, and this is one of the exercises that um, our friends at Casco Bay High School created or adapted to be used with a guide. And as you're thinking about um, other, other forms of bias, including gender identity, and it seems like from this question, how do we keep new students from giving up on these topics, so a topic that is difficult um, and, and, and needs a little bit more attention around, um, maybe starting with some of the optional exercises, the personal identity charts, and working with students on charting that, and from there, figuring out which sections of the guides are most appropriate to continue that conversation. 
There are a number of questions that have to do with um, using this guide in, in a kind of a culturally uh, or homogeneous kind of setting, you know, maybe in a very small town or, or a place that simply doesn't have much diversity, at least racial and ethnic diversity, um, and, w and whether this kind of discussion can even happen in a productive way in those kinds of settings. And I think I would say yes, that it can, and I've seen that, seen that work. Um, partly because one thing that tends to happen is that even even a community that you sometimes think of as being quite homogeneous, you know, when you actually get people to talk about difference um, in various ways, that it, it's in fact not as homogeneous as you think. <laughs> that people that there are more uh, differences than you may, and, and you know, of course, you know, like. Nicole was just saying, this is not just about racial and ethnic uh, differences, it's about other kinds of differences as well that, that we hope will come up in these, in these sessions. So that's part of it. But also people will talk about kind of other people they know or other, other kind of, um, you know, dynamics that they've observed. And so, you know, even though the, the, it doesn't seem like something that, that uh, is it, harder to, to broach, you know, in the kind of a, uh, what seems like a homogeneous setting, in fact, it's, it's not as, as homogeneous as you might think. Another thing is that, that part of the structure here is, is to kind of putting on the table different views and options that people may not have heard before, may not have considered before. So, so that's a helpful thing when you've got a group that seems to be kind of fairly, um, you know, on the same page. They all think the same thing, you know, and sometimes that is true. They all kind of, you know, maybe have very similar experiences, perhaps. And so the idea of kind of having different views in the guide itself, um, in a way that. Um, encourages people to kind of grapple with them and kind of look at um, uh, pros and cons, that, that is a way of kind of diversifying the conversation in a sense, even if the group itself is not all that diverse. Here's a, <laughs> a good question. A person asks, I realize this might not, might not be your remit, but if you could make one systemic change, <laughs> which would possibly affect the increase in racist incidents, what would it be? Um, so, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of possibilities um, that we all could, could imagine, I think. Um, you, you want, and I don't even know, I haven't thought about this for about 20 seconds here, but, um, but and I don't know if I would even agree with this um, 10 minutes from now, but, but I think one thing that, that seems to me very important is that communities and school systems, schools, just don't have opportunities, you know, to talk together in productive settings and good ways about issues that they care about, whether these are issues of bias and discrimination uh, or issues of safety or the city budget or, you know, any one of a number of things that may actually affect their lives. And so if you have uh, a system, and this is what the question is asking about, a systemic change, if you have a system which gives people those kinds of opportunities on a regular basis where people of, of different views, different backgrounds can get together to talk about why these kinds of issues matter to them and what they might actually do about them. If those kinds of opportunities are built into the way that our, our institutions work, schools, local governments, other kinds of settings, then that, I think, can affect all kinds of things, including how they treat each other, how uh, bias and discrimination is felt, not only in a kind of behavioral sense, but also in an institutional sense in the community. So that's, that's, um, that's my, my quick, quick uh, answer to a very large and complicated question. <laughs> Uh, so, in a, uh, so there's a couple of different questions I think that have to do with kind of scale um, and how to to uh, use this kind of approach in a large district. And I think my answer to that would be um, mainly to start small. Uh, you know, don't don't kind of try to kind of um, you know conquer the whole thing <laughs> at, a, at at one meeting. Start small, pilot the guide, bring together a small group of people, uh, perhaps a diverse group. You've got some students, but also some teacher staff, maybe a community member, a parent, um, and actually have people kind of go through the guide and see what it's like, um, and figure out how they might want to use it in in your district, um, how you might need to adapt it, what kinds of information people would need about the local context. Um, you know, so. So that's, you know, there's nothing that replaces experience when it comes to kind of getting people to, to do, do public engagement. And then there are some really good examples of how some large districts have used this kind of resource. So one, one great one is in Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, the Montgomery County Study Circles, uh, which have been in place there for many years, uh, I think 
close to 20 now at this point, uh, 20, and it's a process by which all kinds of people have been part of discussions, kind of like the ones we're talking about here, uh, on issues of race and difference, and has had a, a, a range of, of, of outcomes in, in that district. So that's that's one good example to look at that's a kind of a, a large kind of district and a, and a kind of a district-wide approach. There are a few questions about sort of subtle forms of racial, ethnic, and religious um, bias, maybe these sort of lighthearted jokes and point pokes at people or, um, you know, um, sort of um, comments about people's name if, if they're um, um, different from the larger members of the of the community um and and we we've been mentioning a lot about the guide but I do want to bring to your attention again the text talk engage exercise that is um also a um a tool that in many ways it's it the the upfront work is a lot e a lot easier you know again you just need a small group of people to have these very personal conversations um and you won't need to find a facilitator um and so Again, it, it doesn't necessarily, it, it talks about bias writ large, but in those smaller intimate conversations, you can sort of um, start to address some of these more um, under, under, uh, undercurrents of racial and ethnic um, bias that may be institutionalized in your institution. So um, again, take a look at that. Super easy to even just walk through it. Um, as I said, we, we launched, we're launching it today. I walked through it in five minutes, just kind of taking a look. So look at that tool to see if that works to deal with some of these other issues. Yeah, exactly. And that was, that's another answer to the question that I was trying to answer a minute ago. How do you get started, especially in a, in a large district? Is you, you know, basically that, like Nicole was saying, you know, text talk engage is a kind of a way of supporting the process through a smartphone that doesn't require having a, a kind of a live facilitator there. Um, and partly because it's an even smaller group and partly because the, the, a lot of the, the discussion is kind of, and the support for the discussion is kind of built into the process. So take your smartphone, you know, text engage to 89800. Um, and you will basically see, you know, um, kind of the way it works and the different polling questions that are there and the discussion prompts that are there. And you can kind of envision a little bit how people might use it. And then the next step after that is, you know, find two or three other people <laughs> and actually do it with them um, and, and talk about the discussion uh, questions and, and, um, and answer them. And, and uh, you know, that, that's it's just a way of kind of... Um, uh, kind of an easy lift way of kind of getting into this kind of conversation, and then the the text talk engage could be used in in in, in um, uh, you know parallel to kind of these larger face to face conversations using the guide. They're they're kind of two different levels, uh, two different levels of commitment from the participants. Um, you know, one is easier, more convenient, can be more decentralized. One is more intensive, more uh, you know larger groups. Um, but uh, so they have different levels of impact, but at different levels of, of investment required to make them happen. I think we are pretty much. So I'll read. Um, I think we're we're coming to the end, but we have um, about one more um, that I wanted to. Um, highlight one more question. How could a district or building make this work or adapt if it relies on face-to-face -face conversation and you have a very slight population of ethnically diverse uh, students? Um, you, you touched upon this, Matt. Did you want to just... Well, so, so um, yeah, I, I think, that, yeah, it, it, it's uh, kind of... Um, I think what I was trying to say before is that even if if the the kind of school district is, is or school is, is more homogenous and it you know, is, it seems very homogenous, that that people actually have a more diverse array of experiences and backgrounds than you might expect, and so there will be lots of different ideas that come up in the conversation, and then also um, uh, th that uh, you you can. Um, uh, had a second point now. I forgot what it was. <laughs> uh, another person just asked us now. Montgomery asked for the name of the district that I mentioned is Montgomery County Public Schools in Montgomery County, Maryland. And so the, the, it's the, the name of the, the project there is called the Montgomery County Study Circles. And well, again, well, this, this kind of thing we'll, we'll put in the follow-up email so you can look for it there. 
Uh, oh, and another person actually, uh, and thank you for this. This is another person suggested another example, which is a district uh, uh, in uh, in Las Vegas, this Clark County School District, that has been doing a district-wide sort of process for the past five years. Um, it's partnering with the city of Las Vegas to, to to kind of as part of their cultural competency framework. So there's another example to to, to check out. I didn't know anything about it, so thank you for for kind of suggesting it um, right here on the call. So. Um, Thank you again uh, for participating. Please do feel free to um, to send us uh, questions. Uh, and certainly, if you use the guide, we'd love to know more about how it works for you, what you do to kind of adapt it. Um, or, um, uh, we want to kind of collect as many of those kinds of stories as we can, so we can kind of alert other people to how they might do similar sorts of things in their districts and in their schools. Uh, we'll be sending again. Again, I'll be, we'll be sending out this kind of follow-up email, uh, you know, with a number of the things that we've talked about, examples and uh, sources, and the guide itself, uh, some of the websites we may have mentioned. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Um, and certainly, in the, in the same vein as the person who just suggested the Clark County example, if you know of other examples that people want to know about, please send them to us, and maybe we'll add that those those uh, other suggestions to the to the um, to the follow-up email. I'm sure all of us could benefit by those kinds of uh, other resources. Um, I've just put up on the screen, um, you know, some of our information about how you can connect with us through Twitter, LinkedIn, um, our website again, Facebook, uh, certainly uh, those kinds of things. Um, so uh, please feel free to kind of reach out to us that way. Um, and I'm now looking to my colleagues to see if there's anything else that we should have talked about. Thank you again, um, and please uh, let us know how this guide works for you, um, and thank you for, for taking this step of, of trying to help people in your school or your community deal with some issues which are incredibly important, often very difficult and intimidating to deal with. Uh, so thank you for kind of your courage um, and um, persistence in trying to address these kinds of issues and questions in, in, on behalf of students and on behalf of other community members. Thank you.